never agree with one another 100% of the time. Conflicts of interest are unavoidable, especially in politics. Sometimes, during a standstill, a mediator can step up and squash the issue, even if they don't agree with either side entirely. Working on a group project and two people clash heads? Dig in and be the mediator. So today, we travel back to the late 18th century, when major disagreements amongst America's founding fathers had our newborn country in danger of being split before it could even grow. Today, we discuss partisanship. This is America's Constitution, signed by 39 of our most important founding fathers. Yeah, some of the handwriting is even worse than a doctor's, but it's still a big deal. However, just because many heavy hitters of the revolution signed this document doesn't mean everyone wanted to in the first place. On one side of the argument were the Federalists. Federalists were really into the Constitution. They believed it was necessary improvement to the old Articles of Confederation because it solidified the power of the central government and provided a structure for America to grow. But not everyone agreed. This is where the Anti-Federalists come in. Anti-Federalists' main concern was that if the federal government was given too much power, America risks becoming a monarchy like England, whose butts we had just kicked to gain our independence. Both sides had valid points, but they weren't settling differences over cordial dinners. The Federalists and Anti-Federalists fought in newspaper essays, pamphlets, state ratifying conventions, and even in taverns and on street corners. Being partisan in politics is very serious business. Thankfully, a monumental compromise was made between the two sides when the Anti-Federalists succeeded in having the Bill of Rights added to the Constitution. The Bill of Rights appeased the concerns of many important founding fathers who felt the Constitution needed some tweaking. Despite this breakthrough, there was still tension. As disagreements over policy mounted, political parties formed, with the Federalist Party and the Democratic Republican Party leading the charge. One major clash of ideologies came in 1798, when the majority Federalist Congress voted in the controversial Alien and Sedition Acts. Madison wrote a famous response to the acts in 1798 called the Virginia Resolution, which said that states had the duty to pull rank on the federal government and decide what was best for their people. States began choosing sides. States like Kentucky and Virginia said, get lost to the acts. Others like New Hampshire gave a thumbs up and deemed them constitutional. As America grew, so did debates on how to handle it. For instance, by the 1830s, the North and the South had different methods of making money. The North was becoming more industrialized, while the South remained dedicated to farming and agriculture. When Congress passed taxes that Southerners thought benefited the North and not them, they were none too pleased, especially South Carolina. Even Vice President John Calhoun hated the taxes, so much so that he would resign as Vice President under Andrew Jackson. That same year, South Carolina, led by Calhoun, told the federal government to take a hike with their taxes and even threatened to leave the Union if violent action was taken against them. So what did President Jackson do? He threatened South Carolina with war. That's what he did. Thankfully, there would be help. At the zero hour, the day was saved, at least for the time being, in large part due to a Kentucky senator named Henry Clay. Clay brokered a compromise between the federal government and South Carolina that lowered the tariffs and appeased the angry state. The crisis was over. Our country, for the time being, was settled down and ready to prosper. Sadly, things wouldn't be so hunky-dory down the line, but that's a story for another day. 